I was here last year in a very different capacity uh, talking about uh, the Google baseline study. Now I have a somewhat different topic. My real job here is really to be a front man for Taha, who will be uh, following and showing you some very specific things going on at the FDA and opening up uh, the knowledge base and the treasure chest that really exists inside of the FDA that it would be great if more people um, could access. So just my uh, disclaimer here, I'm very early at the FDA, two months into it, and I can assure you uh, not a day goes by that I don't learn something that's major, new, that I'd never heard of before. So my goal today is to review some ideas, but the implementation of these ideas is really work in progress and it will evolve. And I'm sure I'll look back two months from now and say, gee, I was really stupid uh, two months ago as I was thinking about these things. Now, I just want to acknowledge that um, I thought I was pretty smart in academia and I arrived at the FDA with all sorts of concepts and things that I wanted to do. But it's literally the case that every good idea that I've had, there's somebody at FDA already working on it. And a big part of my job is not really then to originate ideas, it's to work across this large organization and the many people it intersects with to try to uh, make things better, to identify common themes and concepts that would benefit um, this wide array of uh, issues that the FDA has to deal with. My key premise overall, and really the reason um, I decided to make the leap, is that I've noticed in my career as a clinical trialist and researcher that regulation and clinical practice, uh, now I can say both at the individual and population level, are fun and satisfying when good evidence is available to inform decisions. Most of the big problems that occur in places where we just don't have the evidence, people get all worked up and excited and have opinions, um, but when they're not based in any level of evidence that one could really depend upon, then it sort of tends to devolve into arguments rather than mature discussions about what to do. And I think uh, the reason to be at the FDA right now is that we can uh, improve the evidentiary basis for medical decision making and decision making about individual health by at least a log order in the very near future. And, um, if, even if I had been skeptical before, after sitting through the last 24 hours and hearing about the avalanche of information and depiction of uh, the human condition that we've seen, um, really translating that into practice uh, to useful technologies that will improve uh, health and uh, treat disease uh, is something that I think we can really do. Now, I'm uh, going to ask for your sympathy here in this part of the talk. Um, and, but as you think about uh, your roles in the big data system and ecosystem, which is a term that I love that's been described, uh, as you look at what the FDA is doing, um, it's important to consider that there are really two missions embedded within the FDA mission right on the website. The first that almost everybody understands is protecting the public health. And I must say, um, when uh, I'm in meetings that have to do with uh, innovation and new technologies, many people involved who have never had the experience of hurting someone with a well-intentioned technology uh, can forget about uh, this mission. But remember that the history of the FDA was really built on disasters that occurred, not necessarily because of bad people, but because of well-intentioned ideas that went awry, which then led to legislation which created a regulatory authority to try to prevent that from happening again. And I think it's entirely predictable as we go into this uh, new era where so many new things are going to happen that there will be some bad things that happen that will actually guide uh, where regulation should go. But we don't know exactly what those are going to be right now. The second mission is a part that's really fun. Protecting the public is important, and it's a mission that, you know, I, I just am almost overwhelmed by the intensity with which those who work at the FDA take this seriously because they've seen so many things happen. Um, it's a great mission to protect the public health, but advancing the public health by speeding and enhancing innovation is uh, really a fun thing. But you can appreciate these two missions are um, somewhat in conflict and they've got to be um, balanced because the safest thing to do to protect the public health just from a defensive perspective is to never innovate. Uh, if you're going to innovate, uh, there are going to be problems that occur, and it's finding the right uh, set of uh, uh, feet on the uh, accelerator versus the brake uh, that, that's really, I think, the biggest challenge at the FDA right now. 
So continuing on the police have sympathy uh, theme, this is just to remind everyone the complexity of the organization, organization that you're dealing with as you think about whatever aspect your interaction uh, has with the FDA. Uh, human and veterinary drugs, biological products, medical devices, the food supply, cosmetics, and everything that emits radiation, yes, including microwave ovens. So we have to deal uh, with all of that and keep it in mind. And remembering that policies that um, have to do with one of these aspects, sometimes in a very complicated American legal system, can spill over into having an impact uh, on policies in another area, something that I didn't appreciate enough until I got to the FDA. And in this uh, advancing the public health, um, it actually is uh, in the mission statement to speed innovations. I did catch a problem on the FDA website. It says make medicines more effective, but I would now uh, expand that, and we're in the process of th uh, thinking about doing this. It obviously, devices should be in this sentence also, in addition um, to diagnostics. And then finally, and not to be forgotten in this area, the FDA has a critical mission uh, related to counterterrorism. And when you think about the 25% of the economy that's regulated by the FDA and the impact of globalization, uh, the importance of inspections and understanding um, the supply chain for products and food that end up uh, on your table or in your house, uh, very much a, a key uh, issue uh, with the FDA. So what about these big cross-cutting um, issues that might affect big data? And so I'm really talking in generalities here, but I would argue that each one of these is really important for someone to have the big picture about um, as we think about big data. And these are things that I hear in every aspect of the FDA, yes, including uh, the Center for Tobacco, which I knew very little about, which has a major mission that you're going to be hearing much more about the next several years as the legislatively uh, mandated um, controls on tobacco products uh, come into action. There's a lot of confusion out there in the scientific world about this array from biomarkers to surrogates, patient-reported outcomes, patient-derived data, now preferences in geospatial framework and social networking. It's gone from a fairly simple depiction of developing a drug over a number of years to things happening all at one time in all these dimensions. How do we take this into account? And then the very system of evidence generation, which is a lot of what uh, has been talked about in this meeting, um, much of it is brand new, really beginning to take systems biology seriously instead of the old stick diagrams that we were taught in medical school. Uh, um, biomarker A relates to disease B and you, intervention C uh, cures the disease. We know that's not the way it's going to work. And all of the things that you all have talked about the 24, past 24 hours have shown that. We've now got real world data on a grand scale also talked about here. And I think there's a belief uh, that I, I've heard widely shared here that I would sub subscribe to also. The curated data should be a common good. But we're working in an environment where protection of intellectual property is a major part that's written into the law that governs FDA. And working out the uh, new rules that should exist in this world of a datafied uh, environment, very important. And then patients at the center. It used to be that patients were uh, benefiting from the largesse of all of us brilliant people that did medical research and developed products. But we're now in an era where patients are not patients, uh, they're participants, and they're not just uh, benefiting from research, they're actually now often uh, very involved in the design and the funding and the um, prioritization, as we heard earlier today. And then ethics. The current system, I would argue, is characterized by what's been called research exceptionalism, by some really uh, um, excellent uh, British uh, bioethicists. But there's great empirical dis uh, data to support the view now that um, research needs to become uh, viewed as more a standard part of learning that we do in healthcare. The majority of people would like their data and samples to be used for research. And I would urge you to watch the notice of proposed rulemaking for the common rule, which is about to come out, the rule that governs all of the federally um, associated uh, human research. And of course, Kathy Hudson talked about the Precision Medicine Initiative, which will be an embodiment of this um, new era of involving people directly in the control of their information on a much larger scale. 
In the midst of all this, we must remember that uh, we're only 4% of the world's population. I won't say more about that because it's come up over and over. And then finally, the last two slides. Um, in the ideal world, we would benefit from every encounter with the healthcare system, and increasingly now with what we've seen uh, these days with wearable devices, et cetera, benefit from the aggregation of knowledge constantly uh, as we go through the system. And I think you'd all agree that the magnitude of the explosion in data is much greater than the reality of taking this data and turning it into knowledge that people can really use to improve their health. This is a key role of the FDA. Um, at, at the end of the day, as technologies are, are made available to the public, we know that Americans are dependent uh, on the FDA for them to have assurance that if they do something with medical technologies, that it will be uh, considered to be safe and effective. In order for us to play this role, though, it's not the FDA alone. We're part of a very complex ecosystem, as the point has been made over and over again, and many other people need to step up to the plate in ways that hasn't happened before. In short, I would say, again, if the FDA is presented with well-curated data, with good metadata, adequately powered, answering real questions about the usefulness uh, of drugs, devices, and biologics, my job becomes a fun and very easy job. And when my job is fun and easy, I would argue that practitioners and those uh, who are making decisions in health systems also have an easy job. I'll skip over the precision medicine because it's already been covered and close with this slide. Um, what we want from the FDA is for you to be creative in using big data. We don't want to stifle that. We want to encourage innovation, but we also want you to be responsible and realize that um, it's not just a scientific question that you're asking as you get into human big data. It's information that will be used by people, and if you do a good job, people will make better decisions, live longer, and have a better quality of life. So thanks, and I, I look forward to the discussion period.